Welcome to the Apologetics Tool Chest, where we provide for you the tools necessary to combat the various criticisms against Seventh-day Adventism. My name is Edwin, and I am your host. Enjoy this episode. Some time back, Alan Parr released a video on Seventh-day Adventism endorsing it as another Christian denomination while at the same time disagreeing with a few of its doctrines. A few days afterwards, however, Alan released a second video retracting his previous endorsement and outlining why he believes the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a workspace religion. According to Alan, Adventists believe Ellen White's writings are on par with the writings of the Apostle Paul. Taking issue with her being a woman and misrepresenting official Adventist beliefs in regards to inspiration and authority by quoting a few Adventist authors, Allen sought by this to classify Adventism as a dangerous movement that Christians ought to stay away from. Probably on the icing on the cake, however, at least for me, is Allen's baseless claim that Adventists are trying to hide what they really believe in order to deceptively convince people to convert to Seventh-day Adventism. Because of this, and many other things that Alan said, we at the Adventist Defense League decided to do our part in responding to Alan's allegations. As we go through each section, we will give some more detailed information towards the bottom of this video and a description of some other materials you can go to for further study. These materials are meant to respond to the critics and to respond to the specific allegations that Alan made in regards to Adventists and Ellen White. In a future video, will make a response to his allegations regarding the investigative judgment and the sanctuary as well. Let's begin. What will happen is this, is whenever you talk to somebody from the Adventist faith, they are trained to basically only tell you some of the things that they believe or just basically stay on the surface in fear that if they really tell you some of the big differences between what they really believe and what they've been trained and raised to believe and what you as an evangelical Christian believe that they are going to lose or miss out on the opportunity to convert you over to being an Adventist. But the claim that we are trained to hide information in order to convert people is baseless. First of all, Alan provided no proof of this claim except his own words. In fact, there is evidence to the contrary. Some of the biggest evangelistic ministries that circle the globe are Adventists, like Amazing Facts, It Is Written, and Voice of Prophecy. Moreover, the Ellen White website has made all of Ellen White's writings available for free online and in book format as well. Additionally, our church is present in over 200 countries worldwide, running a 2018 membership of over 21 million. It has over 8,000 educational institutions, over 700 healthcare facilities, including hospitals and clinics, as well as orphanages, and our beliefs are saturated within these institutions. Moreover, we also publish our beliefs through media outlets such as 3ABN and Hope Channel, along with over 50 publishing houses, 25,000 literature evangelists, and 375 languages. None of these ministries, schools, or healthcare institutions apologize for being Seventh-day Adventists. And are we trying to hide something? They are trained to basically only tell you some of the things that they believe or just basically stay on the surface. As an elder and Bible worker for the Florida Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, the training I received taught me to sit with people of any persuasion, teaching them all of our fundamental beliefs and not some. The proof of this is in a set of Bible study guides we use, which are available publicly. For example, It Is Written has 25 lesson set Bible study guides that are packed with biblical truths. And if you can't purchase them, they are available for free online for anyone to see. Amazing Facts as well. 
They also have a set of Bible study guides. I'll provide a link below for anyone interested in looking through these study guides for themselves. Finally, Jesus says, I have many things to tell you, but you are not able to handle them now. Here is a principle that Adventists seek to apply in their evangelistic efforts. It's not that Adventists hide their beliefs. It's that we seek to be wise like serpents and gentle like doves. Here is a lesson that all Christians can apply. While we should never try to deceptively hide our beliefs, we should always try our best to avoid prejudice in our efforts to preach the gospel and win souls to the Lord. Let's go to the next allegation. They truly believe that if you do not keep the Sabbath, you are an apostate. You are a rebellion, a rebellious person rather, and God's favor is not on your life. We have a misunderstanding here. Adventists fully believe that there will be many people in the kingdom who have never once kept the Sabbath. Are you looking for a simple, Bible-based, practical Christianity? If you wondered, what is it that God wants you to do for Him? What are the steps you should take in drawing closer to Him and His Word? What does the Bible say and how do you apply it to your life? How do you pray practically to get the answers you need? And what does it really mean to surrender your life to Christ? These are the kinds of questions that Petra Dotson wants to help answer. Petra's YouTube channel is focused on everyday Christianity, seeking to get rid of that gap between what we believe and what we practice. Petra uses her ministry experience as a Bible instructor and missionary to help you find out God's plan for your life in a hands-on and inspiring way. Visit her YouTube channel today and click on her subscribe and bell buttons for future notifications. You can find her on Facebook as well. This is a budding ministry that wants to grow with those who truly want to know God's will for their lives. Subscribe today. Even now we believe there are many people in other denominations that truly love the Lord and are considered God's people. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in their sins and lest you receive her plagues. However, we also believe, as the Bible clearly says, that those who reject the light of the truth are guilty of sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's the truth. Notice what Jesus told the Pharisees. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Later he also said, If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. You see, it's when you know and understand the truth that you then become guilty if you willfully reject it. Our own commentary says the following. We shall not be held accountable for the light that has not reached our perception, but for that which we have resisted and refused. A man could not apprehend the truth which he has never been presented to him, and therefore could not be condemned for the light he had never had. Additionally, we don't go around telling people that they are a apostate, rebellious people, and that God's favor is not in their lives. And people who do that are not representing the true spirit of Adventism. But when we believe a system is teaching heresy, however, we too will speak out against a system that teaches error. But that does not mean, however, that we are attacking the individual people in those systems. My commitment to you all on this channel is to always preach the truth of the Word of God, but when I get it wrong, you have my word that I will always be humble enough to come back and admit to you that something that I said in the past was not correct. This is a precious and Christian position that Alan has taken, and we hope that the evidence in this video will persuade him to admit that he has not been in all things correct. After quoting Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9 in conjunction with Ephesians 2, Alan explains why he quoted those verses. Now, why do I share that scripture? Because whenever you dig deep into the Seventh-day Adventist faith, what you will see as you uncover layer after layer after layer, and you finally get down to it, you'll see that they truly do teach a works-based salvation. Unfortunately, Allen didn't dig deep enough because Adventists do not teach a work-based religion or a work-based salvation. Now, while critics will typically take certain Adventist quotes out of context, what we really teach is salvation through grace, which works. You can see this for yourself in Ephesians chapter 2, which Alan quoted from. For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The text is clear. We are God's workmanship, which literally means something made or a product. As God's product, we are created in the Lord for good works. So we see that there are works involved right here in the text so often quoted by critics. But where do those works come from? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. These works, they don't come from us. Of ourselves, we cannot do any works that can earn us this grace. He saves us freely through faith in His grace towards us and then imbues us with good works which originates with Him, causing us to become obedient to His will. In a parallel passage in the book of Titus, Paul explains that grace is actually power to live righteously in this present world. Notice what it says. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Notice first what grace does. It brings salvation. That's something that is given to us freely, something we do not need to earn of our own works. Our past sins make it impossible that we could ever be righteous before a holy God. And since we cannot attain to salvation by our works, God has to bring salvation to us through grace. But notice what else Paul said. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave some hope for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous of good works. As you can see, grace actually empowers you to live righteous lives. And this is not something that happens in the future when Jesus comes. No, the apostle says that that happens in this present world. The Bible says that God's commandments are righteousness. And since we are saved by grace and not of works, no amount of obedience can earn forgiveness. So what does Jesus do? He came to live a perfect life that covers the imperfect past of believers. He forgives us of our sins. He cleanses us of all unrighteousness. And then he empowers us by his grace to live out the righteousness of his commandments in our lives. That is all God's doing and not ours. This is especially illustrated back in Ephesians. After telling them that they are saved by grace and that God imbues them with good works, Paul tells them, whether implicitly or directly, to obey God's commandments. This is important to remember because a lot of critics point to chapter 2 verse 15 to say that the commandments have been abolished. But this cannot be referring to the Decalogue or else there would be a serious contradiction here. Evidently, the word commandments doesn't always refer to the Decalogue, for the verse says, Commandments contained in ordinances. Ordinances were ritual laws which tended to separate the Jews from the Gentiles. Telling people not to kill, for example, does not cause separation, neither do any of the other commandments in the Decalogue, for that matter. Allen thinks that Adventism teaches a works-based gospel. But I think Allen mistook Adventism's emphasis on a saving grace that empowers believers to be obedient with legalism. It is not that we do something to make ourselves spiritual. That's legalism. It is that God does something to make us spiritual. That's grace that leads to obedience. There's no certainty of salvation in their faith. There's, there, they don't even believe that you, can, you are saved right now. They believe that you're being saved or you will be saved, something of that nature. This is also false. While there may be individuals in the church who do not have assurance of their salvation in Christ, the Adventist church does not teach that. On the contrary, fundamental belief number 10 says, Through the Spirit we are born again and sanctified. The Spirit renews our minds, writes God's law of love in our hearts, and we are given the power to live a holy life. Abiding in Him, we become partakers of the divine nature and have the assurance of salvation now and in the judgment. Here's what Allen probably observed and likely misunderstood. It is a statement from Ellen White that speaks sensibly for itself. Peter's fall was not instantaneous, but gradual. Self-confidence led him to the belief that he was saved, and step after step was taken in the downward path until he could deny his master. Never can we safely put confidence in self 
or feel this side of heaven that we are secure against temptation. Those who accept the Savior, however sincere their conversion, should never be taught to say or to feel that they are saved. This is misleading. Everyone should be taught to cherish hope and faith. But even when we give ourselves to Christ and know that He accepts us, we are not beyond the reach of temptation. God's Word declares, Many shall be purified and made white and tried. Only he who endures the trial will receive the crown of life. Contextually, we see that she's talking about the danger of having confidence in self. In this chapter, Ellen White is commenting on the parable of two worshipers that we find in Luke chapter 18, where one, a publican, was humble and repented of his sins, while the other, a Pharisee, was prideful and self-confident. Her warning is against people like the Pharisee, who though they profess to follow God, think that they cannot fall into temptation and lose their connection with Him. Notice, all our good works are dependent on a power outside of ourselves. Therefore, there needs to be a continual reaching out of the heart after God, a continual earnest heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of the soul before Him. Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. The Bible says that in us there dwells nothing good, that our hearts are deceitful, and that self must die. In John chapter 15, Jesus said that believers must continually abide in Him and keep His commandments. And if they don't abide in Him, they will be cast into the fire to be burned. Paul warned, Therefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Now this strikes out a very popular belief held by Alan himself called, Once saved, always saved, which is a false doctrine. But while the Bible says that God will never lose us, it also says that we can willfully choose to lose him. Think of the parable of the prodigal son. After being in a loving relationship with his father, he left them to experiment the world. But notice the words of the father when the son returned. For this my son was dead and now is alive again. He was lost and he is found. After commending the church at Ephesus, Jesus warns them against losing their salvation. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen Repent and do the first works, or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstands from its place unless you repent. In Matthew 18, we learn through a parable that a man once forgiven can be lost. Notice what happened. Then his master, after he had called them, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespass. In 2 Peter chapter 2 speaks of those who once escaped from the fleshly lusts of the world and are overcome and again entangled. The apostle actually says that the latter end is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. For it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. In Hebrews chapter 10, the author gives the readers this warning, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For ye a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, what does it say? My soul shall have no pleasure in him. I just want to give you a few more verses. Notice what Paul said. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. For those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also 
will be cut off. Now this warning would make no sense if we were once saved, always saved. Finally, and probably the biggest blow to the doctrine of once saved, always saved is found in the book of Ezekiel. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he hath committed. Because of them, he shall die. And the example that Ellen White herself gave in context was that of Peter, who confidently boasted about his own confidence, which led him in the end to denying the Lord three times. For each of the classes represented by the Pharisee and the publican, there is a lesson in the history of the Apostle Peter. In his early discipleship, Peter thought himself strong. Like the Pharisee, in his own estimation, he was not as other men are. When Christ on the eve of his betrayal forewarned his disciples, all ye shall be offended because of me this night, Peter confidently declared, although all shall be offended, yet not I. Peter did not know his own danger. Self-confidence misled him. He thought himself able to withstand temptation, but in a few short hours the test came, and with cursing and swearing, he denied his Lord. This is all that Ellen White is talking about, losing confidence in Christ and placing confidence in self. But does that mean she did not believe in assurance of salvation? Of course not. On the contrary, placing our hope in Christ grants us more assurance while we continue in Him. A few paragraphs later, north of the statement, she wrote this. He who through his own atonement provided for man an infinite fund of moral power will not fail to employ this power in his behalf. We may take our sins and sorrows to his feet, for he loves us. His every look and word invites our, here's the word, confidence. He will shape and mold our characters according to his will. Actually, assurance of salvation was a constant theme in her writings. For example, if you give yourself to him and accept him as your personal savior, then, Sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. And the Bible affirms assurance of salvation, but only while we remain in Christ. Paul said, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. One more verse. The Apostle John wrote this. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. My friends, Christ will keep you in his grace. He will give you the strength to remain in his love so long as you don't willfully choose to abandon him. He will surely never abandon you. Now returning to the accusation, this is all that Adventists believe on this matter. We definitely do believe in assurance of salvation, but we are also not presumptuous. We understand that we must ever keep our eyes on Jesus, just like the Bible says in Hebrews 12 verse 2, and abiding in Him continually so that we never look to self and risk abandoning the Lord. Let's move on to Alan's next accusation. But what I want to talk about first is the foundation of the Adventist church, right? So I want you to think of the Adventist church as a house. Now, at the bottom of that house and every house, there's a foundation. The foundation of the Adventist church, whether you talk to somebody and they agree or not, just trust me on this one, is the teachings of their prophet, Ellen G. White. So my goal in this video, and we'll see how far we get, is if I can cut down or undermine the foundation of the Adventist church, i.e. the teachings and the prophecies of Ellen G. White, then my friend, you can basically tear down the entire Adventist faith. 
Our foundation is the Bible, and we've made that very clear in our fundamental beliefs. Notice what it says. Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as their only creed and hold certain fundamental beliefs to be the teachings of the Holy Scriptures. And in the section talking about the gift of prophecy, it says that the writings of Ellen White make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. Read it for yourself in The Great Controversy. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds and decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord. One of the biggest problems here is that Ellen G. White is a woman, all right? Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but the Bible clearly teaches that in terms of spiritual authority in the church and uh, uh, teaching doctrine and exercising authority over men in the church, that this is prohibited. Yes, Alan, our church has just affirmed a few years ago that only men can have the teaching authority of elders in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You might wonder why, then, we do not discard our female prophet. The answer is very simple. While the Bible has zero female priests or elders, it is full of female prophets. Here's an example. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time and would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. We have here a woman prophetess who did not hold a position of authority, and yet the people of Israel came to her because the messages she bore were from God. Take a look at the command that the Lord through Deborah gave Barak. Then she sent and called for Barak the son of Abinoam from Kadesh, in Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops in Mount Tabor. Take with you ten thousand men of the son of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulun, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitudes at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hands. Can you imagine Barak saying that she had no authority over him because she was a woman and he was a man. You see, Deborah was a prophetess, but she was not a leader as we have today with pastors and elders. Nevertheless, her words were authoritative because they were not her own. She was relaying a message that God had given her. Let's keep talking about this. The scripture says in 1 Timothy 2.12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. Now, once again, um, we're not going to get into that. First Timothy 2.12, I believe it is. Um, but essentially that right there is one of the biggest problems in the Adventists is that, is that their entire theology, for the most part, was formed and formulated by Ellen G. White. Just a simple stroll through our fundamental beliefs shows the heavy scriptural support we provide for our doctrines and we even go deeper into our theology at such websites like the Adventist Biblical Research, for example, where everything is proven by the Bible. Now, I want to briefly touch on the text that Alan brought forth from 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, the fact that women in the church should not have authority over men does not mean that they cannot be used by God as prophets. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul wrote that women who have the gift of prophecy must use it in ways that do not undermine male leadership. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying and prophesying, having his head covered, dishonor his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. Without going into the topic of head coverings, implicit in the text is that women can certainly be prophets 
while at the same time allowing men to exhibit their God-given role of leadership. This is what we saw in the story of Deborah and Barak. Deborah was a prophet, but Barak was the leader. You know what's interesting about this? Is that there was actually a rumor going around during the times of Ellen White saying that she was trying to exhibit the role of leadership or decision maker in the denomination. But notice how she responded to this. No one has ever heard me claim the position of leader of the denomination. I thank the Lord that he gave us the privilege of acting a part in the work from the beginning. But neither then nor since the work has grown to large proportions, during which time responsibilities have been widely distributed, has anyone heard me claiming the leadership of this people. I am not to appear before the people as holding any other position than that of a messenger with a message. A few paragraphs later, she wrote this. Every conference, every institution, every church, and every individual, either directly or through representatives, has a voice in the election of the men who bear the chief responsibilities in the general conference. In the early days of our denominational work, the Lord did designate Elder James White as one who, in connection with his wife and under the Lord's guidance, was to take a leading part in the advancement of this work. Ultimately, she believed that God was the leader of the church. But as you can see, she acknowledged that God chose men to lead out in the work of the denomination. By the way, apart from being prophets, women can also play an authoritative role as teachers in the lives of other women and in the lives of their children. You can see that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, chapter 3, and Titus chapter 2. And even though in the context of the home and in the church, God has chosen men to lead out, that does not mean that God will not use a woman in a special way to give authoritative prophetic utterances even while she's not performing the role of leadership over men. In the end, the utterances are not from the prophets anyway. They're from God who has chosen to speak through the prophet. That is what makes those words authoritative. I'm gonna take you over to the Adventist.org website where it says, Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as the only source of our beliefs. We consider our movement to be the result of the Protestant conviction, sola scriptura. Now, if you don't know what sola scriptura means, sola only, scriptura, scripture. So that's basically they're saying only scripture. We believe in only scripture, okay? The Bible as the only standard of faith and practice for Christians. Now, you may think, Brother Allen, that sounds about the same thing that we say as evangelical Christians. You're right. That's exactly what they want you to think, right? Yeah, we believe in the Bible and only the Bible. But let's go deeper. Now, every time Alan says, let's go deeper, you have to go right behind him to verify what he's saying. We saw earlier that after claiming to have gone deeper, he accused us of not believing in assurance of salvation, even though our fundamental belief, number 10, actually says we do believe in assurance. Now, in regards to Sola Scriptura, it is because we adhere to the Bible and the Bible only that we believe there will be prophets in the last days because that's what the Bible says. We'll look at that a bit more after his next accusation. So now let's talk about um, Ellen G. White, all right, and her, how they view her position in terms of her authority to interpret this one soul truth. Before we go to that website, let me clear something up here. Alan said that we view Ellen White as having the position of interpreting the Bible. This is false and represents Alan's total misunderstanding of how we actually view Ellen White and how inspiration works. Previous to this, we saw that Alan quoted from our fundamental beliefs, which states that Adventists go by the principle of sola scriptura. Like I mentioned before, it's because we go by sola scriptura that we believe that God will set up prophets in the last days. Take a look at these verses. Joel chapter 2 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Now this outpouring of the gift of prophecy was to take place more than once, just as it says a few verses earlier. Be ye glad, then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, 
for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in his first month. And we know that this prophecy was partially fulfilled at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. But was this to take place in the last days as well? Let's go back to Joel. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. According to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, these events will take place at the end of the world. Therefore, since the Bible is clear that there will be prophets and prophecies in the last days, rejecting those portions of the Bible that says this is rejecting sola scriptura. Now granted, I don't think Alan rejects the gift of prophecy per se. Alan's problem is this. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. Okay, that's true. This gift is an, un, is an identifying mark of the remnant church and was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Okay, fine. As the Lord's messenger, here's the problem. Her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth, which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. They also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. Now, I want you to go back to this phrase right here. Her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth. My friend, that is a problem. Her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth. My friend, that is basically elevating her writings on par with the level of the Apostle Paul. Okay, so Alan is here quoting from an old version of that particular fundamental belief. We stand by that statement because, of course, if prophets don't have authority in the church as they did in Bible times, then something's wrong. The 2015 updated wording of that particular fundamental belief makes the thought a bit clearer. Her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. Now watch this. I want you to notice here that this was the previous statement that was on the Adventist.org website. Her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth. Now I want to show you what it says as of today. As of today, Whenever you click on the Adventist.org website, it says here, this gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church, and we believe it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort and guidance, blah, 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 blah. Do you see what they did? Do you see what they did? They removed the phrase that her writings were um, uh, what did they say? A, authority, a continuing, uh, a continuing and authoritative source of truth. They removed that phrase from their website. Why? Because they had such a difficult time trying to harmonize some of her false teachings and false beliefs with the scriptures. The idea that this update was done to supposedly harmonize her teachings with the scriptures is simply inaccurate. Here's a statement that clarifies the exact reason why the wording was updated. Some have felt that the church's prior statement gave Adventist church co-founder Ellen G. White authority comparable to that of the Bible. Changes have been made to remove this potential ambiguity. White herself emphasizes that her authority is subject to the scriptures. The new wording of the statement does not in any way diminish the church's understanding of the authority of the Bible or the prophetic authority of Ellen G. White. In other words, the church was seeking to avoid exactly what Allen had accused us of, that her writings are on par with the Bible. Second, 
our list of fundamentals have always contained a disclaimer at the beginning which says that revisions of these statements might be expected at a general conference session when the church is led by the Holy Spirit to a fuller understanding of Bible truth or finds better language in which to express the teachings of God's Holy Word. The church has never hid the fact that these statements may be updated when appropriate. This is because Adventists believe that a, a list of fundamentals should never serve as some kind of creed. Only the Bible is our creed. And third, the supposed false teachings of Ellen White, that was not even a discussion when the update took place. There were actually two topics that took center stage during this 2015 general conference session. The first was creation. Due to the invasion of some evolutionary theories creeping into some of our institutions, Delegates wanted to make sure that Adventists were clear on the fact that the earth was created recently in six literal days. And the second major discussion was, of all things, women's ordination. The church actually voted no on ordaining women as pastors. I wonder if Alan knew that part. There are members of the Adventist church that believe that Ellen G. White's writings were inspired by God. And on the same level, as the Apostle Paul. All right, so there are two statements here. First, that we believe that her writings are inspired by God. And second, that those writings are at the same level as the Apostle Paul. Now, Alan puts these two statements together as if inspiration equals canon, but that's not necessarily the case. Here's an example. Now, the Acts of David, the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel the seer and in the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the book of Gad the seer. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilamite, and in the visions of Iddo the seer against Jeroboam the son of Nebat? Notice that these prophets, who were inspired by God, wrote down their oracles and made them available for the people to read at that time. And since the Bible recognizes no degrees of inspiration, the messages and writings of these prophets were no less inspired than those of the canonical prophets. Well then what's the difference? The difference is that while both non-canonical prophets like Nathan and Gad and canonical prophets like Paul and Peter are equally inspired, yet the authority of non-canonical prophets is subordinate to the authority of the canon. In other words, just because the writings of a prophet are inspired, that does not necessarily mean that they are at the same level as those prophets whose writings form a part of the canon of the scriptures. Add to this the fact that the Bible itself says that there will be inspired prophets in the last days, and the conclusion is evident. There will be prophets in the last days who are inspired and who have authority, but whose authority is subordinate to the authority of the scriptures. This is why we constantly find Ellen White pointing back to the Bible as the final authority. Moving on, Alan showed a few quotations from some Adventists that talk about this inspiration. There's two things I want to say here. First, for official statements in regards to our beliefs, people should refer to our fundamental beliefs and the actual writings of Ellen White herself. People can make mistakes and often express the church's beliefs in terms not necessarily the way would church would express them. This is why our fundamental beliefs are liable to getting updated by voting in a general conference session. Because we are always praying for better ways to express what we believe. Second, it's not that it's wrong to quote an Adventist, but additionally to comparing their statements to our fundamentals, their statements should also be read in their own context. For example, anti ly websites love to quote Kenneth Wood's statement that Ellen G. White was inspired in the same sense as were the Bible prophets. But what happens when we read that quote in context? The scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are divinely inspired. This canon of scripture is the standard of faith and practice. Ellen G. White was inspired in the same sense as were the Bible prophets, but her ministry and writings were given to exalt the Bible. Ellen G. White's writings, by her own testimony, were not intended to give new doctrine, but to direct minds to the truths already revealed in Scripture. As you can see, the quote is saying that although we do believe she was inspired, 
that does not mean that they are canonical. You know, it's been my experience in over a dozen years doing this ministry that critics are always taking quotations out of context. And here we have a perfect example. Had Allen really dug as deep as he claimed he did, he would have seen this. Let's look at another one of those quotes that Allen shared. This one is from the Review and Herald and is found at the Adventist Digital Library website. On page 11, you will find a statement in question. Notice the disclaimer found only a few words before. As stated in our last article, the writings of Miss Ellen G. White were never designed to be in addition to the canon of scripture. Again, inspiration does not equal canon. There are examples of this very thing in the scriptures, as we already saw before, in the writings of prophets like Nathan and Gad. Sometimes critics will get information from other critics who already have a preconceived or biased opinion, and then share that material as well, instead of going deeper doing our own personal research and taking our time doing it. If you can't call any human being other than the people who wrote the scriptures and say that their writings were an authoritative source of truth, no, no, there, there is no more authoritative source of truth other than the, the New Testament scriptures. Let me ask you a question. If an archaeologist discovers the writings of non-canonical prophets like Gad, Ahijah, or Nathan, will those writings be added to the canon of scripture? Of course not. And yet King David did not question Nathan's authority as a prophet, irrespective of the fact that Nathan's writings were not a part of the canon at that time. Now what about after the canon of scripture has closed? Does God raise prophets at that point to speak with prophetic authority? Yes, the canon itself tells you that. We saw some of that earlier when we looked at certain texts like in the book of Joel. But I want to share a few more verses. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Since we are still in need of working the ministry and being edified, and since we have not yet arrived at a perfect knowledge of the Son of God, or unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, then evidently, we are still in need of these gifts, including prophecy. Here's another text that demonstrates that prophesying would continue amongst God's people until the second coming of the Lord. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, and abstain from all appearances of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you. Now notice this. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto when? Unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The admonition here is to not despise prophesying, but rather to test them, indicating that this is talking about more than biblical prophecy, which does not need testing. Note here that Paul's advice was to continue all the way until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this next text. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. This word was written with direct reference to the last days, to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. To Paul, the church was to extend all the way to the last days, and it was to this church that was confirmed the testimony of Christ. Now what is the testimony of Christ? And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And God's people in the last days are described as those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
In view of all these verses that we just looked at, what do we conclude? Number one, that God can inspire prophets to speak with prophetic authority while not adding their writings to the canon of scripture. And number two, that those who profess to stand on the Bible and the Bible alone are bound to receive what the Bible says will exist in the last days, the gift of prophecy. The Bible says this in Hebrews 1.1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, here it is, listen, spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. So what is the author of Hebrews saying? He's saying in the past, God has spoke to us through the prophets, but today God speaks to us through his son, meaning Jesus, along with the apostles who had the heart of Christ and understood his doctrine, that is how we hear from God. Jesus is who speaks to us today through the written word of God. While it is true that God speaks to us through the canonical scriptures, again, that does not mean that God will not speak to us through prophets as well. It is the canonical scriptures that tells us that there will be prophets in the last days, like we saw before. There is an example in the Bible of a time when God spoke to his people through both the canonical scriptures and also through a prophet. It's in the story of Holda, the prophetess, and Hilkiah, and they that the king had appointed, went to Holda, the prophetess, the wife of Shalem, the son of Tikvath, the son of Hesra, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they spake to her to this effect. Notice first that she points to the Bible. And she answered them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell ye the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah. Now notice that after quoting from the scriptures, she points to a personal message that God wanted her to relate to the king. Now imagine for a moment Hilkiah telling her that her prophetic message to the king was not an authoritative source of truth because they now have the book of the law. How well would that have gone? Clearly, God can and has spoken to his people by both means, even though the oracles of the prophets were subordinate to the scriptures. And since there will be prophets in the last days, it is evident that God will speak to his people in the same manner. Allow me to elaborate a bit more on the authority aspect of this discussion, because it seems like that's Alan's biggest problem. You never really know where you're staying when you go on vacation, but you'll know here. Hostessy is a vacation homes company owned and operated by a faith-based family. Their homes have all the accessories needed to feel right at home in the sunny state of Florida, along with a backyard setting and grill, playrooms, and a lakeside view. Their homes are located in Central Florida, close to major parks and famous restaurants, yet reserved in private gated communities for safety, comfort, and peace. Their excellence in serving vacationers has awarded them the status of super host on Airbnb. Visit their Facebook page for more information or their website at myhostinflorida.com. Hold this message and the written messages of Nathan, Gad, and Ido, though equally inspired, are not equally authoritative. This is an important hermeneutical point that we need to keep in mind. The oracles of the non-canonical prophets had limited or circumscribed prophetic authority. Why do I say that? Because the messages of non-canonical prophets should always point to the higher authority of the canonical scriptures, just like Holda did. This is what Allen does not understand, and every other critic for that matter. Identical inspiration, wrote Professor Judd Lake in Ellen White on the Fire, does not mean identical canonical authority. Here's a helpful analogy that Professor Lake provided in his book. In the military, for example, the general of an army carries the highest degree of authority. When a lower ranked officer, such as a lieutenant, gives an order to a foot soldier, that soldier is obligated to obey the lieutenant's order with no less a degree of obedience than if the general had issued the order personally. The lieutenant is simply carrying out the order of the highest ranking authority, the general of the army. You see, although the lieutenant and the general are both authoritative, 
the authority of the lieutenant is derived from the authority of the general and is therefore circumscribed. In this sense, Ellen White's authority is viewed like the authority of prophets like Holda and Nathan, whose oracles were circumscribed or subordinate to the scriptures, but not as prophets like Paul and Peter, who were given the privilege of providing writings that form a part of the canon of the scriptures. Notice that Ellen White did what Holda did, point people to the Bible. The Lord has sent his people much instruction, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Just like the moon does not give off its own light, but reflects the light of the sun, so the writings of non-canonical prophets are to point and reflect the light of the scriptures. Notice what else she said. I recommend to you, dear reader, the word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that word, we are to be judged. God has, in that word, promised to give visions in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people, and to correct those who err from Bible truth. The Lord desires that you study your Bibles. He has not given any additional light to take the place of his word. This light is to bring confused mind to his word, which, if eaten and digested, is as the lifeblood of the soul. And to one person who placed her writings on par with the scriptures, Ellen White responded by saying this, Brother J would confuse the mind by seeking to make it appear that the light God has given through the testimonies is in addition to the word of God. But in this he presents the matter in a false light. God has seen fit in this manner to bring the minds of his people to his word to give them a clearer understanding of it. Replace the words Brother J with Alan Parr, and you'll quickly see how Ellen White herself would have responded to him. Adventists do believe that the canon of Scripture closed with the book of Revelation. But true to the principle of sola scriptura, we also believe what the Bible itself says, that God will raise prophets in the last days to comfort and warn the people and lead them back to the Scriptures. And that, my friends, is what gives the prophets authority. Now, I haven't forgotten about Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to look at that text. But first, I want to take a look at Alan's next accusation. You have the Bible, but the Bible is only the, it, the, the only source of truth. As it is first understood and interpreted by Ellen G. White. Do you see the difference, right? In other words, yes, we believe in the Bible. We believe in only the Bible as it is interpreted and understood by Ellen G. White. If Ellen G. White says this is what the Bible teaches about the Sabbath, about salvation, about investigative judgment, which we're going to talk about later, please don't, don't stop this video. Don't stop this video because I'm going to get into this other issue that is the biggest heresy in their movement in just a couple of minutes, right? But they depend significantly on her understanding and interpretation of the Bible and whatever that is, that is what causes them to believe their beliefs. Unfortunately, and I want to be nice here, Alan doesn't really understand Adventist beliefs or Adventist history for that matter. Our church has sought to clarify our understanding of the gift of prophecy in various ways. One of them was by publishing a document titled The Seventh-day Adventist Church's Understanding of Ellen White's Authority. In this document, they produced 10 affirmations and 10 denials regarding Ellen White's authority and inspiration. To spare you from having to read it all, I'm going to show you only the parts where we specifically deny the accusation critics like Alan make against the church and provide a link below to where you can go and read the rest of the document. Denial number one. We do not believe that the quality of degree of inspiration in the writings of Ellen White is different from that of scriptures. Denial number two. We do not believe that the writings of Ellen White are in addition to the canon of sacred scripture. Denial number three. We do not believe that the writings of Ellen White function as the foundation and final authority of Christian faith as does scriptures. Denial number four. We do not believe that the writings of Ellen White may be used as the basis of doctrine. 
Denial number five. We do not believe that the study of the writings of Ellen White may be used to replace the studies of the scriptures. Notice this next denial. We do not believe that the scriptures can be understood only through the writings of Ellen White. In fact, we have documented stories where the pioneers would spend hours and even days with little sleep studying a subject without having any help from the spirit of prophecy until finally all their energies were exhausted and God would send light on the subject. But even then, the pioneers continued to study and never once quoted Ellen White as a reason for believing in a doctrine. Now this does not mean that we do not believe that prophets are reliable teachers of the Bible, but we do not accept a prophet lightly. After vigorous and extensive testing, we tentatively accept a prophet as likely exercised by true spiritual gifts of inspiration. And during this time of testing, it would not be wise to take the doctrinal teachings of the would-be messenger as having authority. But once the authority of a prophet is established reasonably, it would be sensible to trust what God says through the prophet under inspiration regarding scripture. Scripture still reigns, however, as it was used to test the prophet. But now scripture says, despise not prophesying, and so we believe. This is consistent with various examples we see in the Bible. In Acts chapter 8, we find Philip being told by the Spirit to cause an Ethiopian to understand the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 4 says that prophets were given to unite the saints so that they would not be carried about with every wind of doctrine. Similarly, in Acts chapter 15, when Jewish believers were debating what to do with Gentile believers, God sent the prophets Judas and Silas to confirm the conclusions they reached through prayer and the consultations of the scriptures. In another resource published in 1988, the church decided to further clarify its stand on the writings of Ellen White. This resource came in the form of a book, and it was titled, Seventh-day Adventists Believe. I especially want to quote this book because it summarizes nicely some of the previous points I already made. Notice what it says. The prophetic gift produced the Bible itself. In post-biblical times, it is not to supersede or add to scripture because the canon of scripture is now closed. The prophetic gift functions in the end time much as it did in the time of the apostles. Its thrust is to uphold the Bible as the basis of faith and practice, to explain its teachings, and to apply its principles to daily life. Post-biblical prophets function much like prophets such as Nathan, Gad, Asaph, Shemaiah, Azariah, Eliezer, Ahijah, and Obed, Miriam, Deborah, Huldah, Simeon, John the Baptist, Agabus, Silas, Anna, and Philip's four daughters, who live in Bible times, but whose testimonies never became a part of the Bible. The writings of Ellen White are not a substitute for scripture. They cannot be placed on the same level. The Holy Scriptures stand alone, the unique standard by which her and all other writings must be judged and to which they must be subject. The founders of the church developed fundamental beliefs through the study of the Bible. They did not receive these doctrines through the visions of Ellen White. Notice in that last quotation that rather than judging the Bible through her writings, we judge her writings and everyone else's writings by the Bible. And after some detailed information about how to test the prophets, the book provides two examples of prophecies that actually came to pass the rise of spiritualism, for example, and the close cooperation between Protestantism and Catholicism, something that was unheard of during her days, but obviously came to pass. Then it ends by sharing a very insightful quotation from Ellen White herself. The word of God is sufficient to enlighten the most beclouded mind and may be understood by those who have any desire to understand it. But notwithstanding all this, some who profess to make the word of God their study are found living in direct opposition to its plainest teachings. Then, to leave men and women without excuse, God gives plain and pointed testimonies, bringing them back to the word that they have neglected to follow. The written testimonies are not given to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the hearts the truth of inspiration already revealed. As the prophetess Huldah, who pointed the people back to the scriptures, 
and Judas and Silas, who confirmed the decision already drawn up by the council. And as is the role of all non-canonical prophets, her role was not to interpret the Bible for us, but to lead us to a deeper, more intimate study of the Word of God. Paul said, prophets were given for the equipping and edification of the people. Where there is no vision, the people perish, we're told. Believe the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Now, after quoting Hebrews chapter 1, Alan had this to say. So what is the author of Hebrews saying? He's saying in the past, God spoke to us through the prophets. But today, God speaks to us through his son. Meaning, Jesus, along with the apostles who had the heart of Christ and understood his doctrine, that is how we hear from God. Jesus is who speaks to us today through the written word of God. Ironically, it is the written word of God which says that there will be prophets in the last days. Consequently, Hebrews chapter 1 cannot be interpreted to mean that God will no longer speak to his people through prophets after the closing of the canon. A closer look at this text simply reveals that Jesus was the climax of all that was spoken by the prophets, yet it was Jesus himself who said that there will be false prophets in the last days and that we are to test them. How much easier to say that there will be absolutely no prophets in the last days and thus remove all chances of being deceived than to give a test by which to try them. The implication is that there will be both the false and the genuine manifestations of the gift of prophecy and that God's people should be ready to put them all to the test. Now, in order for me to properly respond to the next section, I have to show Alan's remarks for a bit longer than I've done before. So we're going to hear Alan speak for just under a minute and a half. Now I want you to see what Ellen G. White has said about herself and how similar it is to Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, okay? Notice she says this, In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. Sounds very similar. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. Now, just so you know, so you're clear, anytime you see the phrase testimonies of his spirit, think of Ellen G. White. Think of Ellen G. White. Anytime that an Adventist refers to that phrase, the testimonies, the prophecies, the testimonies of his spirit, they're primarily referring to Ellen G. White and her teachings. So what is she saying? Do you see what she did? She is inserting her name using scriptural language to say in the past, God spoke to people by prophets and apostles. But today, he speaks to people through me, through the testimonies of the Spirit, by what God is showing me. First of all, Ellen White did not insert her name into the text, nor did she say that today God speaks to the people through me. That's not what she said. It's like if I told my son, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Does that mean that I am inserting my name into this verse and claiming to be God? Of course not. I am simply using biblical language to convey something that's actually true. Second of all, in the context where that statement is found, she is emphasizing the importance of obeying God's teachings and commandments. As an example, she cites Abraham, who promptly obeyed the word of the Lord when he was instructed to sacrifice his son. She also cites the example of King Saul, who rejected God's direct command to destroy the king of the Amalekites and all his possessions. Her warning to the reader was to obey God and not to commit the same act of rebellion against God's commands. Does this sound to you like she's replacing God's word with her own? By the way, many of her revelations or visions or prophecies, she believed that she received them from an angel, right? <clears throat> from an angel. Now, what's interesting is that Paul said in Galatians chapter one, even if an angel comes and says that there's a different gospel, let, let that man be accursed, right? So many of her teachings, she claims that she got this from an angel. Alan makes this comment as if this was the way to determine if someone was a false prophet. However, God has often spoken to prophets through angels. For example, we see the angel Gabriel speaking to the prophet Daniel. 
He also spoke to Zacharias and to the Virgin Mary. An angel spoke to the Apostle John also. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. As a matter of fact, an angel spoke to Paul also. Evidently, the fact that an angel spoke to Ellen White no more proves that she was a false prophet any more than an angel speaking to these people proved that they were false prophets. Galatians 1 warns against falsehood, but it does not say that the appearance of an angel proves an individual is a false prophet. Let's go to the next accusation. Even one of their revered members, Robert Olson, said this. He said, I believe that both Ellen G. White and the Apostle Paul were true prophets who wrote under the influence of the Holy Spirit. My reason for believing in the inspiration of one is identical to my reason for believing in the other. My friend, that is very problematic. When you have members in your church that say, that even mention of Ellen G. White and Apostle Paul in the same sentence, right? That is a major, major problem and say that my reason for believing in Ellen G. White's truth is identical to believing in the Apostle Paul. My friend, that, that is heresy. The problem here that Alan has a different understanding of what it means to be inspired. As we mentioned before, the Bible does not give any evidence of degrees of inspiration. Many people who hold to degrees of inspiration have ended up claiming that portions of the Bible are less inspired than other portions. It's a very dangerous theory. The Adventist understanding is the same as many other non-Adventist scholars. God equally inspires prophets and he does divest them with authority, but their authority is subjected to the authority of the scriptures. Recall the examples of prophets like Nathan, Gad, and Deborah, who were equally inspired by God as were the prophets who wrote the Bible texts, yet whose authority was not equal to theirs. There's inspiration, and then there's authority. Ellen White's writings are subject to the canon of scripture we have today in the same way that Nathan's writings were subject to the canon of the scriptures that were in existence during his time. Like I said before, the writings of non-canonical prophets are always subordinate to the writings of the canons of the scriptures. Now this is a theological discussion that has been debated for centuries, of which we don't have a lot of time to cover in this short video. But if God inspires his prophets with the same degree of inspiration, while at the same time only authorizing a few of them to compose the canon of the scriptures to be of the greatest authority, then there's nothing really theological inaccurate with what Olson said. As a matter of fact, in the context of Olson's comment is the idea that Ellen White gave supreme authority to the Bible just as non-canonical prophets of the Bible have done. A conspicuous feature of Miss White's writings is her undeviating exaltation of the Bible. She does not explain it away, but is always a faithful interpreter. I freely admit that she has helped me to maintain my faith in the Word of God. Thus, even though Olson recognizes that inspiration is not given in degrees, yet he is not placing her writings as equally authoritative as the scriptures. On the contrary, he says her writings exalt the Bible and leads men to maintain their faith in the Word of God. Now, this has only been a partial response to Allen's first attack against Adventists. When time permits, we will respond to the second part of Allen's video, which was attacking the sanctuary and the investigative judgment. However, my assessment of Allen's arguments against both the investigative judgment and the writings of Ellen White is that it is based primarily on a misunderstanding of certain fundamental beliefs along with general disagreements on doctrine. In this video, we can sum up my response into four parts. Number one, Allen claimed that Adventists do not believe in assurance of salvation, but we have seen that this is certainly not true. Our own published statement of fundamental belief debunked this. Number two, Allen also said that Adventists like to hide their beliefs in order to convert people to Adventism, but this is blatantly false for the simple reason that all our beliefs and evangelistic efforts take place publicly. Number three, 
Alan thinks that our insistence to be responsible for the light God has given to his people means that we are condemning them to hell as rebellious. But the traditional Adventist understanding is that those who willingly reject truth are condemned, but that those who have not had a full understanding of the truth may still be considered as God's people irrespective of the particular denomination they may be in. And finally, Allen's biggest problem was the Adventist appreciation for the gift of prophecy in the last days as manifested in the life and writings of Ellen G. White. To Allen, the very fact that she was a woman posed the problem, let alone the idea that her writings contained the same degree of inspiration as the prophets of the scriptures. But Allen's biggest problem is based on an even bigger misunderstanding of how inspiration and authority actually works. Throughout the Bible, inspiration is always the same. Nathan the prophet was just as inspired as Jeremiah the prophet. However, in the Bible we also see that authority is not the same. Nathan definitely had authority as a prophet, but his writings were not of the same authority as the writings of Jeremiah, whose writings made it into the canon of scripture. Ellen White falls under the category of non-canonical prophets like Nathan and not like canonical prophets like Jeremiah. If her writings were inspired by God, then it is only obvious that they are also authoritative. But they are not authoritative at the same level as the canonical scriptures whose writings is much greater and superior to hers and which will always have the final say in every theological matter. I hope and pray that this video was helpful in answering Allen's accusations against Adventism and in clearing the air as to how Adventists really view the writings of Ellen White. Stay tuned as we continue to provide resources such as this one, and I want to make a personal invitation to anybody who may be interested in more information to contact me. I will share with you the Bible study that we typically use when we give Bible studies to people. And if there's any Bible questions you may have or questions about Adventism, I would be more than happy to receive those questions from you and answer them personally through email. Special thanks to Eugene Prerett, who gave some very constructive criticisms in the process of writing the script for this video. And thank you also to Kevin Morgan, who also provided some constructive criticism and helped in the formatting of the script. God bless you, and remember, study the word, but study it deeply.